Back in university, people used to ask me what my name meant. What does Tarag mean, they'd say to me. Loving accuracy, I would go off into the etymological meanings of my name within the Arabic language, and eventually their eyes would gloss over, all confused and distracted. In surrendering to their lack of attention, I would quickly but also excitedly go off on another route. I was the namesake of Tarq ibn Ziyad, I would tell them, one of the greatest military leaders of Islam, who overwhelmingly conquered the Iberian Peninsula back in the early 8th century. Reciting this story would smoothly flow out of me, as I had recited it many, many times. Not only did we have the same name, but we also were born in the same lands, in the northwestern lands of Africa, Algeria to be more specific. I would explain his strength, bravery, and determination in conquering the uncivilized lands of the Visigoths. I knew everything about this man of power, cunning, and leadership, my first ever hero. Or so I thought. Tariq ibn Ziyad was born in 670, and as a Muslim young male, he quickly rose up the ranks of the Umayyad military forces till he became one of the leading commanders of the Northwestern African Campaign. In the year 710, Tariq would be nominated as the governor of Tangier. A year later, Tariq would spearhead a Muslim force of 10,000 men across the Mediterranean Strait and into the Iberian Peninsula. Once across, his conquest of the Iberian Peninsula saw town after city succumb to his military prowess, whether by overwhelming defeat or by pre-engagement submission. Tariq would eventually confront the mighty 100,000-man-strong Visigoth army at the Battle of Guadalete. Tariq's army would record a famous victory that saw the shift in the balance of power on the peninsula. Slowly but surely, Tariq and his forces moved northward till they captured the capital of the Visigoth domain, Toledo. Iberia was now conquered by the Muslims. In recognition for his courage, bravery, and successes, the landing spot where Tariq first arrived onto the Iberian territories had a coastal mountain, and that mountain, from that point onwards, was called Jebel Tariq, the mountain of Tariq, Gibraltar. Growing up, this is the story I had assimilated and knew so well. Full stop. I had no more details about Tariq. Since moving on from being a young boy, my interests took me deeper into this historic, heroic story that resonated with me earlier in life. As I began to research, I discovered more layers to the Tariq ibn Ziyad biography, as well as that of the history of the first Muslim conquests into Europe. So, how much of what I knew of Tariq ibn Ziyad and his conquests was an accurate depiction of history? Quite quickly, I realized there was no one authenticated Muslim version or account of Tariq's biography. Almost every aspect of his life had a variation, and his story at least had three to four versions. And this, to some extent, is a reflection of how the historiography of Muslims and their eras is lacking, and the fact that the history of Islamic empires or nations has a major level of incomprehensiveness and bias associated with it as with many other non-Muslim histories. In Tariq's case, those biographical or historic sources closest to his lifetime barely wrote about him whatsoever, maybe or line or two by the likes of the anonymous compilations Akhbar Majmu' and Fath al-Andalus, or by Ibn Ishaq in his Al-Mubtada' wal-Ba'th wal-Maghazi, Al-Waqidi's Kitab al-Tariq wal-Maghazi, and finally Ibn Abd al-Hakam in his Kitab Futuh Masr wa Akhbaraha. The closest we get in terms of real time accounts of Tariq's lifetime and the encompassing events is a minimum of a century away. What is worse is that the more detailed accounts, the ones that start to breathe new elaborate narratives into his story, come another 140 years later with At Tabari's Tariq al Rusul wal Muluk and Ibn Qutiyah's Tariq Iftitah al Andalus. Such level of detail increases even more by the 14th century, through later Muslim scholars like the Maghribi historian Ibn Adari in his Kitab al-Bayan al-Maghrib, fi akhbar maluk al-Andalus wal-Maghrib. The dissonance that I refer to between Muslim sources 
have created various versions of Tarak's life, as well as multiple historic narratives on the conquest of Iberia. And such dissonances come in the form of seven major elements. Some of the seven are due to the perception that certain subsequent Muslim leaders in history had of Tarak ibn Ziyad, and how their subordinate scholars subsequently fit him in within Islam's story. While other confusing parts and those specific to the events of the Muslim conquest had to do with the socio-political context of the times when these stories were written, and had no real regard for the accuracy of the events that took place in Andalusia, Spain. In Tarak's case, his ethnicity was the first contentious issue. I had only thought of him as Arab, but to my surprise, Tarak was born to an Amazigh tribe in the town of Tilmisan, Algeria, meaning his tribe had to be relatively early converts to Islam, and hence there was most likely an identity change towards an Arab Muslim name at some point in his or his ancestral history. And with more research, I realized that this newly discovered point was also contentious. Numerous sources claim that Tarak was of Persian descent, while other sources put his ethnicity as that of an Arab from the tribes of Hadramut in what is today Yemen. This last version was indeed Arab, yes, but not from where I had expected. And even more recent claims towards his national belonging has arisen, and it pertains to questioning of what Amazigh tribe Tarak belonged to, those in Algeria or those in Morocco. As if the questioning of Tarak's ethnicity wasn't complicating things enough, I discovered that his social status was also an issue. You see, as Tarak and his tribe were recent converts to Islam, he and his kin were labeled as Mawali, meaning that Tarak and his people had to have taken a Muslim identity, while also necessitating the seeking of patronage of a wali, a master. In many cases, a maula was a freed slave, and even if not a freed man, were generally socially inferior. And to be able to rise within society, the Mawla's patron had full control over the Mawla and in their relations within society at large. And for Tarak ibn Ziyad, his wali was Musa ibn Nusayr. And that brings us to the next element that has created much disruption to my original Tarak ibn Ziyad story. I had always thought of Tarak as a lone star, the one-man hero wrecking machine that conquered the Iberian Peninsula. But it seems that was a bit of youthful exuberance and naivete from my side. Musa ibn Nusayr was Tarak's superior, his boss, who answered directly to the caliph at the time, Al-Walid I, and his role in the conquest of the Iberian Peninsula was also greatly impactful. He was an integral hero in the story as well. He himself instructed Tarak to initiate the raiding party when Muslim forces first crossed the Mediterranean Strait. Musa also supported Tarak with many of his own military forces to make sure of the eventual Muslim victory when they confronted large Visigoth opposition. And Musa himself, months after Tarak achieved significant territorial gains, himself led a parallel invasion along a different route within the Iberian Peninsula. And then there is Mughid al-Rumi, who isn't present in any of the early narratives and only arrives onto the scenes of the Iberian conquests through the 13th and 14th century historical accounts. At one end, he is merely Musa's messenger, and at the other end, he is the conqueror of the Iberian Peninsula, with Tarak taking a back seat in history. I'll come back to Marid later, so let's move on with the rest of the elements that complicate Tarak's story. Not only was there now more than one hero to the story, there had to be drama, envy, jealousy, and infighting of the highest caliber. You see, when Musa instructed Tarak to invade the Iberian Peninsula, he did so not expecting the magnificent successes Tarak would achieve. With these successes came great reward, recognition, and most importantly, booty. And it is contentious, but written in many historic accounts, that when Musa finally reached Tarak in the conquered lands, he severely reprimanded him and demanded all the booty he had taken. Tarak acquiesced. Musa's fear continued on in other different accounts, with accusations that Tarak was repeatedly insubordinate, and that such recklessness could have caused the full annihilation 
of the Muslim military. Another surprising characteristic of the conquests in the Iberian Peninsula was how disorganized the military campaign was. No high-level strategy seemed to exist, solely the actions of a young leader who succeeded in one battle, and henceforth moved on to the next, and so on, till two-thirds of the peninsula was conquered. Even when Musa joined in on the campaign, his route was not one in coordination with Tariq. On the contrary, it was almost as if the two parties were competing while in parallel attempting to entirely avoid each other. This was not the version of the campaign in my story, one that I thought was distinguished with vision, planning, and ingenuity. Not only do we have to deal with newfound facts and retold events in the challenging of my original Tarak story, mythology had to invade my discoveries. In many of the historic accounts, both early and later in Islamic history, Tarak, upon landing in the Iberian Peninsula, gives a famous speech. O oh my warriors, whither would you flee? Behind you is the sea, before you, the enemy. You have left now only the hope of your courage and your constancy. Remember that in this country, you are more unfortunate than the orphan seated at the table of the avaricious master. Your enemy is before you, protected by an innumerable army. He has men in abundance, but you, as your only aid, have your own swords. Barak goes on further in his speech, but let's leave it at that. I must say it's a great speech that wasn't in my version of Tarak's life. But that's not where the myth lies. Some scholars introduce the notion that upon the completion of his speech, Tarak ordered the burning of the Muslim fleet. Therefore, there was no return journey. The army had no choice but to move forward. I find that hard to believe, but many today do believe this narrative. It's hard to believe because first, Retreating would never be as easy as to board a ship that was docked so far away from the shores. And second, who would waste such an integral military asset for an unnecessary symbolic gesture? The other element of mythology is that prior to his victory at Toledo, the capital of the Visigoth dominion, Tarak had learned that the sacred and priceless table of Suleiman, Solomon's table, was hidden away within the city. Upon his entry into Toledo, Tarak ordered that the table be brought to him, and within hours, the table was in Tarak's reach. Thereafter, Tarak relinquished the table to Musa as part of the transfer of booty, and it was henceforth unwillingly given as a gift to the Caliph Suleiman ibn Abd al-Malik. In my version of Tarak's story, there was no known end to his life. I didn't know what had happened to my hero. But I expected, as most people would do, that he retired and lived an illustrious and privileged life, honored by those who respected his achievements. Upon conducting the research, I discovered that no one really knows what happened to Tariq ibn Ziyad. The story goes that when the Caliph al-Walid heard of the animosity between our two heroes, Tariq and Musa, he summoned them both to Damascus. The unfortunate reality for the two heroes was that before they arrived in Damascus, a new caliph was in control, Suleiman, the deceased Al-Walid's brother. As per the records, humiliation for both Tariq and Musa followed, stripped of their professions, titles, and property. Some write that they were part of the Umayyad court till the end of their lives. Other accounts indicate that Tariq died in 720, homeless, in obscurity and poverty. This was the saddest part of any of my discoveries. If we look back at all these various elements and how they reduce the power of Tariq's story, I start to then ask the question why. The power of Tariq's story was in its simplicity and tangible impacts to Islamic history. Why would historians introduce details about a hero that originally didn't have many historical records associated with him, especially details that don't exist within his time and era? One perspective would be that Tariq was a victim of racist Amazigh versus Arab mentalities of historians during the medieval times. Being a Barbar, Tariq's legacy gradually deteriorated with the split of the Andalusian Caliphate from the remaining Islamic power centers in the east. 
Umayyad ancestral Arab military leaders were much more preferred by historians and given much more value and impact on the conquests of the Iberian Peninsula. Like in my opinion, how Musa ibn Nusayr and subsequently to a much greater degree with the late introduction of Murid al-Rumi, who both rose in presence within the historical accounts. How could a Barbar and not an Arab be so successful and recognized? The other observation I had while analyzing the research was that during the same period when the Umayyads escaped the Abbasid revolution in the mid-8th century and escaped to Andalusia to then establish the Umayyad state of Cordoba, was that upon such a shift within a mere century, new narratives were introduced, ones that retold history of the importance of the Umayyad story and of the fact that they, the Umayyads, were the heroes of their story and eventually of Islamic history in Andalusia, all at the expense of any accuracy and factual recording of historic events and phenomena. By the 10th and 11th century, Toledo's significance as the heart of the Visigoth nation during the Muslim conquest was replaced with Cordoba, and with it came the many detailed accounts of Cordoba's siege and eventual conquest. Just to clarify, in earlier Muslim accounts of the 8th and 9th century military events, Cordoba is rarely mentioned, except for sporadic cases. Gone also were the Barbar armies that were the front runners to all the initial exploits and in their place were positioned the faithful Umayyad Arab soldiers. Gone was everything that didn't reflect the perfect, ideal and mythologized history of an Umayyad conquest and new Muslim superpower in Andalusia. There are many narratives that attempt to either overlook or marginalize Tariq ibn Ziyad's role in Muslim history, and in my opinion they all fail drastically, regardless of their written references or sources. The biggest proof we have on the nature of Tariq's role in history is the fact that till today a mountain is named after him. Not any mountain, but one at the gateways of the Mediterranean Sea. Such an important honorary reflection with the title of a place would never remain should there have been conflicts or subordinations by Tariq towards his superior, Musa, or if his exploits were overshadowed by different heroes of the time. If this was so, then there would be no Gibraltar, no explicit monumental record of such magnitude to a disloyal deputy or insignificant commander within the Umayyad upper ranks. The same would go for the belittling of Tariq's role due to his non-Arab ethnicity social inferiority, or questionable reputation. There's a common saying that goes, Never meet your heroes. They will surely disappoint you. Of course, I didn't meet Tariq personally, yet sometimes I wish my curiosity wouldn't get the best of me. Leave me be with my original stories, impressions, and imagination. Leave me be with the purity and accuracy of all that came before my wanting to know more. I want Tariq ibn Ziyad to remain a superhero in my books, to be the leader and general who wasn't involved in neither power struggles nor infighting, not part of a conquest that was more randomly successful than was strategically planned. The version I want is of Tariq ibn Ziyad, who did wander off into the sunset, a hero, the myth and the legend, all wrapped into one. Sometimes I feel that my original ignorance was indeed bliss. But at the end of the day, I am adamant to retain my initial memory and hereby challenge the confusing evidence I have stumbled upon. And with that, I still know and believe that Tariq ibn Ziyad is and will always be my hero.